uh, cultural sovereignty makes uh, a lot of uh, notions and concepts very contentious, and in my field, uh, two big contentious issues is around feminism and around gender, and of course about, around human rights. Now, women's rights are human rights, right? We know that. There's a very simple statement, but there seems to be a lack of understanding of the simple statements in um, the Russian Federation uh, for the past, uh, after the Soviet Union collapse, but uh, for the past um, 30 years in the post-Soviet situation. And um, cultural sovereignty is a concept that also accounts for that when uh, women's rights are reduced to the social problem so whenever we talk about uh, uh, women's rights, uh, it's all about benefits and children and family. And that sort of way of reverting that discourse to, uh, to in reducing that to the social problems also reduces women's agency and um, um, uh, creates the situation when uh, women's organizations, feminist organizations, although they are a valid part of civil society, very important for, for development of civil society, are not just shunned by the government, we sort of expect that, but are also shunned by other um, 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 NGOs that uh, would view women's rights as part of a general right. So why should we have that specific uh, uh, way of dealing with women's rights when um, we have the common human rights discourse? Women are humans, right? Right. The one of the explanations to that, uh, and the cultural sovereignty actually provides quite a good um, a view at that, is that uh, the tradition that cultural sovereignty pushes for is not, I mean, it's a, it's a particular specific tradition that exists in Russia, and that's a very much heritage of legislation and policy coming from the Soviet times. It's a result of a radical social engineering that the Soviet Union has done in relation to gender discourse and gender equality, but reverted in the 90s in a very bourgeois sort of traditional way of discussing, um, like women really don't want to work, want to look nice and stay at home, which of course never happened. Um, but the discourse was then sort of this, this um, using this discourse and sort of trying to put women into that framework created this loop in which uh, the government, but also some conservative organizations uh, um, within the conservative mobilization can operate with that. The problem is that women in this situation look for the way out. And they also become, become the um, electorate for Putin. They become also the uh, support for certain conservative organizations. Well, not all women, of course, but if you look at conservative, for example, organizations um, uh, like Erves, uh, uh, the, the, the parent, parental resistance, or uh, 40 times 40, Sorok Sarakov, and others that are still there, um, you can see mostly feminized support for that, which is, of course, very sad, but at the same time, we keep and should be keeping asking questions as to why women prefer to go to support or be part of conservative parental organizations rather than to uh, be part of feminist, right, women's organizations, in a way. Um, that's also a big question of anti-gender movement, of course, in Europe, and it's been asked also in other contexts, in Poland and in uh, Germany, here in, um, uh, in um, Hungary, in, in other parts, in, in Argentina, for that matter. So it's a global movement, of course, but also in, in the Russian case. Um, those women already had human rights, right? But how come they ended up uh, giving up the rights, right, to be uh, willing participants of the discourse? So what is to be done? And um, following the um, famous question, as I'm on this thesis, um, I can't see uh, Luba from anti-feminist war resistance, and because the, the light is right in my eyes, I can see her. But anyway, uh, that is the voice that needs to be heard and amplified. And uh, we work with local people, we regionalize, we speak their language, and I don't just mean Russian, but there's also Tatar, Chechen, Avar, Ruluk, Lak, Tabarsan, and Gush, Ukrainian, Mardva, Udmur, and all these languages, and as women, we're actually very sensitive to that. I worked quite a lot with regional organizations myself, and knowing the language, I'm bilingual as well, so I'm not really Slavic, uh, Having that sensitivity allows us to reach out to the audiences and talk to them and also think about how could we, what could we do. We also continue to support them and that we continue to build free in future Russia. That is impossible without free and uh, safe women, right?